We've got a question and answer section now. Um, so could I invite the panel up onto the, up onto the rostrum here? Professor Amanda Kirby, Alex Isles, Kate Welsh, Richard Evans, and Derek Groves, who is um, Social Enterprise Manager for North East Autism Society. Derek will be doing a lot of the follow-up if you do sign today. Um, so grab a chair, Derek, don't be standing at the end. <laughs> right. Who are you going to say? I'll, I'll, I'll lurk here because I've got you said. Nathan's got a roaming microphone. What were you trying to say, Kevin? No, he's, she's not on the card. He's done it again. <laughs> she's definitely on there. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a long table. You are disappearing. There. And Nerissa Oldfield, um, who uh, is from the British Association of Supported Employment, of which we are members and of which we will do a lot more work, we'll be doing a lot more work with the British Association of Supported Employment. So I really uh, thank you for coming along this afternoon as well. Um, it's your chance to ask questions of the panel. Um, we've got Nathan, who's the roving microphone. He's at the back there. Does anybody have a question they want to put to a member of the panel or the panel generally? Um, Beamish partic particularly attracts customers who are autistic because for some reason they like um, kind of history and yeah. the clothes and the kind of a diff like finding out a bit about how we used to live and maybe that was better for autistic people to be in the Victorian times than it is to be here now and whether you yeah I know what you mean <laughs> um, I don't know the answer exactly because we don't really have a way of testing it but uh, there are a couple of things. One is for some people, I think, uh, on a busy summer's day, it can be pretty horrific. Um, and we're very aware of that. And I think um, we're starting to think about that maybe sort of in terms of after hours experiences. But then it's quite hard for us to offer the same experience out of hours that we offer during the day. So it's quite a tricky one, that. So if you come in the middle of the summer holiday, there might be 6,000 people trying to work their way around the museum, for example. That could be quite intimidating. Um, on the other hand, when we ask all our visitors why they come, uh, one of the top answers, history is very low on the, on the reasons for coming, uh, one, of the, one of the things they say is safety. And they don't mean health and safety, they mean a kind of managed social space. And I think um, there are fewer and fewer places where we can sort of interact within a, a managed space, I think. And I, I do think people come for that because there's a yearning, I think, for you can see it with the digital communities, there's a learning to belong to things. And I think, um, so certainly there's that behaviour. Whether that's peculiar to people with autism, I would say probably not. And I go back to what I was saying earlier on and actually not trying to stress the differences, but I think we share pretty much, you know, we are all the same. <laughs> I don't know whether that's answered your question. Any other questions? Um, hi, um, my name's um, Jodie, and I just wanted to say that it's been a really, really good event today, oh, and that employers should see what we can do, rather than what we can't do. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's a message that a lot of people have, have made, uh, that have given. You know, there's a lot of obstacles that are built into the way that just don't need to be there. A, a reasonable adjustment, small adjustments can make a massive difference. Hello panel, I'm George Forsyth and my question is simply this. There's so many fantastic disabled people, both mentally and physically, in the UK. With so many great projects, do you think that funding those projects is a big challenge? This is to all the panel, by the way. Yeah, do like to, okay. uh, I'll take that initially and I'm sure some of the others will join in because I do sit on boards that uh, look at funding and I also work to support people with that. Um, I think what's really interesting is what we're finding more and more now, there is in some cases less grant funding around than there used to be and we know that 
um, public sector organizations are strapped for cash. But what we do find is that people with an idea that has a real way of bringing value, whether that's about financial value as a social enterprise or whether that's about the social value that you get from really good work, will get funded. So the good stuff always will do. If people need help with explaining how that will work, then they need to talk to organizations that can support that. Because sometimes there's a good idea, but it's not well explained. And what we really want, to, as, so as a funder, so when I sit on a grants panel trying to decide what to fund, I want to see something really good run by people who are passionate and committed, but I do need them to be able to explain it to us as well. So it's getting that package right that I think is really, really important. Can I add to that? Um, very much what Kate's saying, but unfortunately government do not fund all of these projects and there's constant battles going on and it should be just mainstream funded for supporting people with disabilities and hopefully from the new health and work program we will see some forward thinking. Can I just add that uh, a number of the support programs that are available as for an employer uh, tap into a uh, government program called Access to Work um, and there are some new initiatives under that Access to Work program which support the type of uh, services that we're offering today. Um, those include an online application process, making it much quicker, much easier. Um, they include a hidden impairment team that are trained at the other end to support the application process. So it's become a, a much quicker and easier process as an employer to access grant funding. Yes, lady in the middle. Um, I think uh, alongside this, there's been, a, you can see a gradual change in the way the public think about disabilities. And historically, of course, people with disabilities were, were kept away from the rest of the population, uh, be that physical or mental. <clears throat> but the good news is that, especially at the moment, I think, um, I think most of you will have looked on the Beeb and seen um, the recent Paralympics advert where you've got people of various physical and um, mental abilities who are competing for our country right now. And I think the more and more we see people like that actually contributing to life, then hopefully that funding will be available, but also the stigma that actually means that that funding has to be in place will go away. And thankfully our technology is moving forwards, our understanding societally is moving forwards, and I think less and less people who have these disabilities will be seen as outsiders and more and more as just another member of society. Well, that's my hope at least. Can I just make another plea about access to work? Because I think access to work is a fund that's often been not accessed. And um, often in employees and employers don't know enough about it, especially small and medium enterprises, and may not be as aware of it. And it really can be a means of supporting that individual into and in work. And it's worth accessing. It really is. Go online, learn about it as an employer, and tell your employees about it. I think we keep it as a very good secret, really, still. Yeah. Amanda's just actually almost answered... Uh, the question I was going to ask, a lot of the job centres around here, my son, um, I'm a parent of a, a son with autism, um, and he goes to a job centre. They used to have a disability advisor. Yeah. Their role has gone now. And when we go, fortunately, they're very good with him. He always sees the same job coach, and they do try to help him. And she was very interested when I, sh when I told her I was coming today. Um, but there's nobody there to advise him. And these people don't, I don't know whether they're actually aware that this forum's taking place. Um, but I think if, if the job centre had sent some people here and seen the type of thing you're trying to do, I think it would have been invaluable to people like my son. Um, one positive thing is um, there's been a hidden impairment task group and, and it's been set up for DWP. And they've got a lot of all the, the advisors and also on their internet, they've got a toolkit and we're extending the toolkit at the moment to make sure that more people within DWP understand and recognize the signs and symptoms. And so I think there's a very positive approach to say we need to get more information out to more people. Um, and so I think it is changing and I think there is more training going on than there certainly was a few years ago. So I think it's easy to say it's bad, but it's, it's good to say it's getting better. You know, I think it is. There's more information out there than there was a few years ago.
I just on that point, um, Autism Alliance UK, with the North East Autism Society is one charity of 19 autism charities. And we, uh, act I'm actually chair of the Alliance uh, at the present time. Um, we've done training with, um, by the end of October, we'll have done training with representatives from 750 job centres across the UK. The last tranche of it's just about, uh, it's underway now in Scotland and the, the, the uh, South East. We've trained about uh, 2,000 staff in DWP. They are, we're told, reintroducing something that's quite similar to the, um, the, the, the disability advisors that used to be. There is a, 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 part, a, a drive on their part to um, make sure that that kind of inconsistency you've described disappears, that somebody consistencies the individual to give them ongoing support and you don't have to repeat your story every time you go in. Just um, in passing, we, we did design as well a, a passport um, so that people could download from the internet uh, a passport, a communication password that would say, tell, tell people in Job Centre Plus about or about the fact that they would give their home address and personal details, but the fact that they had autism, it would describe the kind of support they'd like, how they'd like to be communicated with, who their advocates are. That's out to its final cons consultation. Ellie was involved in this designing it. It's taken us about a year, but um, we'll get, we've got there now. We've worked in partnership with a lot of other organisations, and that should be released via the Department for Working Pensions this month. Um, there's a toolkit so that people in DWP, their staff, will be able to click on and get information about autism, um, about uh, top tips for making your job centres more user-friendly, um, how you might, what, what you might want to take into account when you're interviewing someone who's come in for work. We've worked with the team who are rewriting the infamous e ESA 40 and 50 forms to make them more user-friendly. And we've worked and some, we've, Maximus have done some brilliant work um, to try and um, to, to, to train people who do work capability assessments. Uh, they've made films about the work capability assessment process, and they're making that a whole lot more accessible and explainable as well. So I think there's quite a lot that's been happening behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, I think DWP people. Uh, I think there's people here today from DWP. Um, they would be the first to say it's a long journey and we've got a long way to go. Here's another, Ali. Um, while we're talking about benefits, um, is it Kate um, said something about how um, parents are often reluctant to let their child go out into the world work. Um, I do think that that's true, but then I think the fact that they're scared about the benefit situation is a genuine fear for the child's safety. And the fact that somebody has autism on the PIP, you know, PIP is a benefit that you're supposed to get um, to help you to work. But because less and less people are actually being able to get PIP, even if they have a communication disorder like autism, they're still scoring zero points on the communication section of PIP. And I just don't understand how that is possible, that you could, <laughs> like, that it should be. I know you're not supposed to look at conditions and things like that. Um, but that if someone has autism, that should show the DWP, the Maximus person, that that person does have a communication disorder, so they need those points. And I just wondered whether, like, if there was an increase in PIP, whether any of you think that that would help people into work because they wouldn't have to worry about their benefits and they wouldn't be holding themselves back. So I just know a lot of people that won't go into the world of work because they know as soon as they do, someone will say, well, you're fit for work and you're at the job centre and there's no help for them there. Um, as the North East Autism Society progresses with their supported employment service, I would see them very much taking on that role, supporting individuals through their benefit system. I know a lot of supported employment services do that because it is a fear that people have. And there are plenty of case studies out there showing people moving into employment and out of benefits, but it's helping people overcome them worries and if yes, if someone loses employment, how easy is it to link back into benefits? But that's where I would see these guys being able to support people through that. Okay. 
Can we make this? Uh, we're, we're conscious of time. Last last question to the to okay. the lady in the back row. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, Hi, I work in a team that diagnoses adults with autism. I just had a question really about employment futures specifically. Um, it's been a wonderful afternoon, and I wondered if you could give a worked example of how employment futures and your support packages could help an adult with autism in the workplace. Derek. <laughs> So there's a, a couple of services that we're promoting within the material that you received today. Um, one of those is uh, to do an individualised assessment. And you heard from Professor Amanda Kirby about the development of an application that really helps that process in identifying what the core strengths are and how they can be applied in a workplace, what areas deficiency might need support in. Uh, that then equips both the employer and us in delivering the right support to the right person. Uh, then there's also, through the access to work process, the ability to put in place a one-to-one -one support. So that can be quite tailored. It's a very flexible grant. Um, so again, down to what that individual requires in that particular workplace to enable them to fulfil the requirements of the role. They're the two key things that we want to uh, have you take away from today. They're very um, easy to, to access. It's access to work. Right? It's an easy grant process to do, and we're here to work with you in that application process. OK, we've got members of the panel who need to run for trains and buses and, and planes and various other modes of transport. It's late on a Friday afternoon. Um, if you do need to run and make a break now, Amanda, I know you're, you're particularly tight on time. I um, Could I just uh, invite Sir Peter to make a couple of closing remarks and um, as, he, as he does that, Amanda will break cover and make a run for <laughs> the centre station. Could you give a hand to the panel, please? Can, can I, on your behalf, just thank Amanda. She's travelled all the way from Cardiff to have a sort of cameo role here. She didn't have long to do our presentation, but it, she's obviously a, a, an expert in this field and it's been great to have her. I think it's been an inspiring afternoon. I have thoroughly uh, been challenged, enjoyed, uh, challenged by all that we've heard. Uh, an amazing array of speakers, Alex, Richard, your stories, a great, a great employer at Beamish, uh, setting a good example for all of us. I'm sure there's a number of us here can do something significant uh, to help Northeast Autism, to help uh, folks with autism into work. Uh, and they will make uh, amazing contributions to our business. We've heard how diligent they are, how appreciative they are of work, and the long-term uh, members of staff. They don't you know, move around and change around. If we can get them settled into our companies, make the necessary adjustments, which if it's only 20 pounds and a little bit of uh, uh, care and attention. But I, I think I just want to praise the work that John and the team are doing. Thank the team here for all they've done to, to set this afternoon up and to gather all of you here today. So please don't go away without signing up. Think of what you can do to help these uh, folks and this region uh, and uh, thank you again for coming and uh, safe journey home. Thank you. Um, well, just, uh, I'd just like to thank Sir Peter. I'd like to thank everybody on the panel. Thank you for giving us your time. And, and as, as Sir Peter said, great, great contributions. Thank you for coming. Um, really, let it start here. Please don't go home. Don't go out of this room without signing up. Or if you do have to rush, please look in your packs. There are uh, website contact details. There are phone numbers. Text us, phone us, ring us, send a pigeon, we don't care. But get, let us move to the next stage. Let us come out and talk through with you how you can contribute to this. Thanks again for coming. Have a safe journey home. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>